Welcome back to Face the Nation. We turn now to the upcoming documentary, City of Ghosts, which focuses on a very unusual group of citizen journalists putting their lives on the line in the fight against ISIS in Syria. Let's take a quick look at a preview. The men and women of Raqqa is being slaughtered silently are real journalistic heroes. They work in secret and under constant threat, reporting on the depredations of ISIS in their home city. Some have fled in fear for their own lives. Even in exile, they are in no way safe. اللي هو جهاز انترنت فضائي ممكن داعش انه تلقط الاشارات تبعه عن طريق سيارات كان لازم نصلي الضوء على مدينة ووقتها بالحقيقية بيننا وبين داعش Matthew Heinemann is the director of the film, and he's here with one of the subjects of the film, Syrian journalist and one of the founders of the group Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, Abdelaziz Al Hamza. Aziz, I want to start with you. You were just a college student that wasn't active in politics. So how did you get involved in this? Yes, so like uh, I had no politic background at all. And when the Syrian revolution started, I decided to be part of it because of the corruption of the Syrian government. So I went to the street. The Syrian government prevented most of the media organization to come to the country and cover what's going on. So with my mobile phone, I decided to film what's going on. And most of the Syrian demonstrator, protester, decided to do the same. And later on, we came together, we gathered together to establish like media centers, organization to report what's going on. And in the film, it said there are 17 of these correspondents. Uh, how do you keep them safe? What kind of threat are they under? So they are walking in a dangerous conditions. But uh, for us, it was like a duty or something that we should to do because ISIS did the same as the government. So they prevented all the media organization to come. So after we started in a month, ISIS executed one of our friends because uh, they stopped him in a checkpoint. They found uh, videos, uh, photos, and uh, many stuff, and our log on his laptop. And the way how we were communicating was like through Facebook, and it was like not as if uh, tool. Later on, after the first execution, we decided to be more careful. So most of our colleagues inside, they came to Turkey, they got the training, and then they went back, and the rest who couldn't make it, they had the training online. And after that first execution, we didn't lose any of our colleagues in Raqqa. So the rest of the execution was like for family members in Raqqa and for colleagues in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Matt, how did you hear about this operation? ISIS was starting to become front page news and I started reading voraciously about this, this group and this phenomenon and trying to understand it and see if there's a film to be made. Uh, I then read this article by David Remnick in The New Yorker about this group and, and just right when I read it I knew that this was my story. In, in terms of an audience takeaway from this film, what's the, what's the message other than the amazing footage? Yeah, I mean, I, I think intellectually, when I began the film, I was fascinated by this sort of war of ideas, this war of propaganda, uh, this information war between RBSS on one hand and, and ISIS's slick propaganda on the other. That's what initially drew me to the film. But the film became much more than that for me. It became a story of these guys being on the run after, the, after members of their group were killed. Um, it became a story, an immigrant story. It became a story of rising nationalism in Europe, where they eventually settled. It became a story of trauma and the cumulative effects of trauma. And so I think with this film, I really wanted to put a human face to this topic that so often gets relegated to, to headlines or stats or photos. Mm -hmm. Aziz, you talked about this was your duty to keep going despite the safety concerns. Why do you feel it's your duty? Because, look, first after ISIS took over our city, they started to spread their propaganda everywhere. They were able to recruit many people. And, like, we knew that what they were talking about or what they're talking about, it were, like, mostly rumors, fake news. And no one couldn't, like, and we started to watch, like, the international media organization taking ISIS as a source. So all of us, we used to work as activist journalists against the Syrian regime, the Syrian government. So we decided, like, to 
complete our work to be against the Syrian government and ISIS. And we started like to report the news. Before we started googling Raqqa, you will have only ISIS video, only ISIS propaganda. Right now, we'll come first after Wikipedia. So we were able like to make a change with this war. Matt, you talked about the battle of ideas. What's the state of that battle of ideas? Right now, we're on the sort of precipice of this battle for, for Raqqa. Uh, the international coalition and the Syrian Democratic Forces are, are, are invading Raqqa, trying to oust ISIS from the city. But I think one of the things that Aziz and his colleagues have taught me in making this film is that bombs are not going to fix this issue. Weapons are not going to fix this issue. There's a whole generation of, of children and people all across the world that have been indoctrinated by this ideology. And so we, as as a society, as, as governments, as corporations, need to find a way to combat this. And I think the work that RBSS is doing is, is truly amazing um, as, as, as one step in, in that battle. All right, Matt and Aziz, thank you very much. Their film, City of Ghosts, opens in New York City on July 7th and in select theaters nationwide on July 14th. We'll be back in a moment. In honor of this holiday weekend, we gathered four authors with new books out. Lynn Olson is the author of Last Hope Island. We're also joined by Sally Freeman. Her book is The Jersey Brothers. Both of these books are set in the World War II era. Now we fast forward a little bit to more recent history and welcome New York Times White House correspondent Peter Baker. His new book is Obama, The Call of History. And John Farrell's latest is Nixon, The Life. Sally, let's start with you. Tell us the story of Barton, Bill, and Benny. Well, this is actually a family story. Uh, three brothers from New Jersey, my father, Bill, uh, my uncles, Barton and Benny, all naval officers. And when war broke out, they were on three different continents. My father set up the White House map room for President Roosevelt. Benny was the gunnery officer on the USS Enterprise, which barely escaped Pearl Harbor. And Barton, whom the older two thought that they had arranged to keep out of harm's way, Supply Corps officer helped him get his commission, had been sent to the Philippines and was wounded and listed as missing. And the story is really about the search uh, by the older two for the youngest, although it has many tears. He was sort of a Rudy-like character um, who was sort of an underachiever. Everyone adored him, and they were so worried and fretted, even as he, in prison camp, came into his own and built a role for himself, and he was a moral um, sort of support beam for all the other ensigns he was imprisoned with. So now let's go to Europe um, in, the, in World War II. What is Last Hope Island? Last Hope Island is England. It's a, story, it's a story that really hasn't been told. It's about England opening its doors um, to the leaders and the military of, of seven occupied countries from Europe um, after the Germans had conquered them. And it's uh, counter to the prevailing myth that, uh, that was actually created by Winston Churchill, that England, uh, plucky little England, stood alone, you know, uh, from the middle of 1940, um, after the German blitzkrieg of, of uh, Western Europe, until 1941, when the U.S. and the Soviet Union were reluctantly catapulted into the war. And that's not true. I make that clear in the book. These Europeans who came there, they escaped. Um, they helped uh, England survive, and then they went on to make enormous contributions to the overall Allied victory. Jack, everybody these days is saying uh, Richard Nixon, his penchant for secrecy, his uh, populism, and, and in, in the, comparing it to Donald Trump. In the yep. Trump campaign, they, would, they compared America his speech at the convention to Nixon in 68. Where do you see the similarities and the differences? In America, There's a great similarity in the investigation and the actual crime. I mean, they both, the alleged crimes were break-ins at the Democratic National Party headquarters. There's very little comparison, I think, between the two individuals. Um, there's a little bit of similarity in listening to Nixon's tapes and reading President Trump's tweets, in that you're seeing sort of the unvarnished presidential id, and future biographers and historians are just going to have, you know, down on their knees praying God thanks every night because <laughs> President Trump insists on tweeting at a time when nobody writes letters or keeps diaries anymore. And a slight, very slight um, uh, comparison in their ability to tap what I call the politics of grievance, which is to look out into their audience and uh, find resentment and actually turn that into votes. Yeah. 
Peter, tell me about the two different timelines of history. When we do a day to day, mm. of course we get everything right and it's perfectly in context. Um, <laughs> but when you write about history, you step back and the things that everybody was obsessed with yeah. um, were not obsessions and the things people missed at the time turn out to be the turning points. Yeah, one of the things I, I've discovered in writing books about presidents that I actually covered is how little we really understand at the time. We get the biggest part of the story, I think, more or less right. In fact, often I, uh, discover that uh, you know at the time some spokesperson said, well, your story is totally wrong. We're not fighting about this. And then later you go back to do book research, you realize not only are they fighting about it, they were you know dogs and cats. They <laughs> yeah, that's right. Lamps were being thrown. But there's so much more to be discovered about every president. You can go back to Nixon's presidency. You can go back to FDR's presidency. There's st we're still learning new things. Well, we learn new things about George W. Bush. I hope. Uh, in Days of Fire. We learned some things about Obama in this book, uh, but they're only first drafts of history in effect. The, the great thing about presidents are we continue to rediscover them, reevaluate them, and, um, and, and learn new things. Sally, I want to talk now about character. What struck me about Bill is Bill is in the map room yeah. and knows what's coming with his two brothers. He knows yes. what they're going to face and he he doesn't tell them he can't do anything about it. Right. Wow. Before every engagement, every lopsided battle where Enterprise went to battle, the ships that had been destroyed at anchor and the fleet and Enterprise with a sorry band of oilers and, you know, patched together destroyers behind them would go to launch for the Doolittle raid, would go, would head for Midway, would um, all those hit and run battles early in the war. And Bill knew about everyone and he couldn't warn his brother. And President Roosevelt knew he had two brothers in theater. He asked about um, them every day. Every time he came to the map room, he would ask. And my, my father liked to say, even with my Republican background, I can't help but like the guy. <laughs> and uh, it was war, and you didn't do that. You didn't convey those secrets. Lynn, you've written about Churchill, and then, but also de Gaulle in this book comes yeah. sort of of age. Is there something you can put your finger on, either with Churchill or de Gaulle, and say, this is what leaders of men all should have? They were very different. They hated each other at times. They had the most amazing screaming matches. People were afraid they were going to kill each other, but they were very alike in many ways, and they were true leaders. They knew from childhood that they were going to save their countries. They were absolutely convinced, both of them. In, in both cases, nobody expected them to. You know, they, nobody expected Britain to survive um, after 1940. Nobody expected France to come back, but those two men were determined that that was going to happen. Yeah, extraordinary sense of nationalism. Um, Jack. After Nixon, give me your sense, his character was relatively clean going into the presidency. Or do we have that wrong? I mean, where, I guess what I'm looking for is, where do you put the pin in his development? So Nixon comes home, he gets elected to the U.S. Congress, and George Marshall goes to Harvard Yard and announces that there's going to be this plan for the Marshall Plan to bring back Europe, to bring back France, so that there is going yes. to be a, a France. And in Richard Nixon's Southern California district, the right wing hated that. His backers hated that. His um, uh, mentor writes, writes him a letter saying, you stay out of this. This is, this is horrible. But Nixon has gone over on a trip to uh, Europe. He has seen the bombed out cities. He's had little German kids come up to him trying to sell their father's war medals to him to get enough money to feed the family. And he comes back and he decides that, you know, what the fam famous Edmund Burke thing about, do I owe my constituency my judgment or do I owe them my, their uh, obedience? And he decides it's judgment. And he campaigns for nine straight months in his district and transforms it. He doesn't just win re-election on the Republican ticket. He wins the Democratic nomination as well. Mm. Amazing, amazing story about Richard Nixon. That's the good side. The bad side is... The day it turns, the day the pin goes in, as you said, John, is the night of 1960, when he believes that the Kennedys have stolen the election from him. And this brings forth this torrent of, of uh, resentment. And he decides then, and his daughter Julie confirmed to me, that that was the moment when he decided he was not going to be outspent, he was not going to be outcheated, he was not going to be out kennedy again, and he would do whatever it takes. Whatever they did, he would match it. <laughs> Peter, did you come to an essential understanding after the work you did on President Obama? His character was off. He was often portrayed as Spock, as kind of aloof. <laughs> right. You could make the case that President Trump is, in, in a sense, an answer to President Obama in the sense that he talked about being a man of action, whereas President Obama said, I'd like to know about something before I talk right. about it. 
was that his essential character or uh, there are other people who said you know he could do the compulsory acts of schmoozing mm. it's just the people he was working with didn't want to be schmoozed so it wasn't that he was incapable <laughs> characterologically it, it just was the circumstances he was in well i just don't think it's the, i don't think it's his nature he's an intellectually uh, uh, driven person he's not uh, a hail fellow well met kind of politician unlike say both george w bush and bill clinton who got energy off of other people who got energy off of crowds like fdr clearly like like Nixon, I think in some ways uh, Obama had a more reserved personality that wasn't generated by other people. And so he saw a lot of that as fake. He saw the whole media construct that he should be schmoozing with Congress more and having them to the White House to watch the Super Bowl as a fake, nonsensical Washington thing. They're not going to vote for me just because I give them uh, popcorn to watch a movie. And he had a point. I mean, obviously, you know, politicians vote their interests and they vote their constituents often and even if they do sometimes <laughs> substitute their own judgment but i do think that we see uh, through history that personal ma uh, interactions do matter and that that was something he just didn't buy into and i think he suffered as a result there were moments where he could have p potentially made a difference had he been more uh willing to play the game it wasn't his thing Sally, you wrote about your father who you knew but then you wrote about as a character too yes. Yeah. I uh, did a similar thing about my mother and found at the end that I knew the person I wrote about better than the person who I knew as oh, a person. Absolutely. Did you yeah. find that to be the yeah. case? Absolutely. I mean, there were there were hints at this. Whenever my father would talk about his time uh, during World War II, his time with Churchill, his time with Roosevelt and in the map room, uh, he became wistful in a way that he wasn't as uh, normally as a person. It was a little bit of a window on the emotional man. He was deeply affected by those uh, three years in World War II. And um, I wanted to know that person. And it was really when my parents had retired to Charlottesville after his long career in Washington. And we were uh, organizing papers and um, I found a stack of files, correspondence files, his naval intelligence files, his White House correspondence files, behind a file cabinet, and I found some photographs I had never seen of the three brothers together. And in those files, um, in one section of them, was the beginning of this search for this younger brother, which when he talked about it and became wistful in later conversations, he would you could tell that this was a deeply emotional um, uh, passage for him. Whenever we talked about it as children or young adults or full adults, uh, the explanations never squared. We just knew that whatever happened um, had affected him and we wanted to know more because otherwise we didn't really see the emotional side of this man. So that is part of what drove me. Jack, you've written about a lot of big characters. What was it like to have Richard Nixon in your head uh, versus uh, <laughs> Tip O'Neill or some of the others that you wrote? Not as bad as expected. <laughs> uh, I did two liberal heroes. I did Clarence Darrow and, and Tip O'Neill. In their case, um, I had to govern my affection. And with Nixon's case, going in, I had to govern my at least skepticism. I was struck by the fact that his, his former aides and the people who knew him were so protective about him. There was this emotional feeling that, that nobody understood this guy. You need to start off on zero before you go off to right or left. And of course, that's what a good biographer should yes. do. Um, he had a lot of wonderful qualities. He had their heart-wrenching moments you know, in the book, talking about Richard Nixon, the guy. Um, and yet, you know, this awful flaw which uh, ended up bringing the country to what Barry Goldwater said was one of the worst crises in, in our history. And he should never be forgiven, as Goldwater said. So it, it, it's tough to live with anybody for six years, but, uh, but, but Nixon always kept me on my toes. He was a, he was always, he was a challenge. <laughs> um, Peter, you've written about uh, Clinton, Bush, Obama. Do you have a theory of the presidency that has, um, um, that has emerged? I had a theory. <laughs> and it's now been blown to shreds. <laughs> My theory was that the presidents were more alike than not, that we make them out to be these very different characters because of politics, because of ideology, because of uh, the necessities of political narrative. But in fact, that Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama had much more in common than they would ever want to admit, right? Different people. But the, the dynamics, the imperatives, the desires, the motives were not that different. And then along comes Donald Trump. <laughs> and I have to say my conception of the presidency has changed entirely. He's so different than those other three that it makes me think that it's not always the same, that they, there are very vast differences in the, in, the, in the nature of people in that office, or at least there is now. Lynn, 
reading your book, I mean, the stories of Britain and its reluctance to be tied to Europe, Absolutely. I mean, it's happening right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, the ironic thing is that thanks to what happened to all these European leaders coming to uh, London, that was the beginning of the European Union. London served as the seedbed of the European Union. If it had, if, if those leaders had not gathered in London, if they had not been forced to work together, to socialize together, to get to know each other, the European Union wouldn't, wouldn't exist today. And the ironic thing is they wanted Britain to lead that drive. They wanted Britain to be the leader of that unification campaign. Winston Churchill and the Brits, because of their insularity, their historical insularity, said no. And as a result, history was changed forever. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here. This was a delight. And uh, everybody, I hope you, you enjoy all of their books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One of the great coincidences in American history took place on the 4th of July, 191 years ago. Two of the country's founders died on the same day, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. One was its author, Thomas Jefferson, the third president. The other was John Adams, a signer of the Declaration and the country's second leader. Also amazing was that they died friends because they had once been vicious enemies. They had worked together forging the nation, won the pen, won the voice of independence. But by 1800, they competed for the presidency in a campaign far uglier than ours today. Jefferson employed one of the greatest hatchet men in politics, James Callender, who attacked President Adams so viciously that Adams threw Callender in jail. He lost anyway. Jefferson and Adams didn't communicate for 11 years until a mutual friend reminded them of their past calling them the North and South Poles of the American Revolution. It didn't take much. A letter from you calls up recollections very dear to my mind, wrote Jefferson. It carries me back to the times when, beset with difficulties and dangers, we were fellow laborers in the same cause. They exchanged 150 letters after that. What allowed them to knock off the crust of hatred was their love for a shared set of values, the Jefferson and Adams reconciliation matched their hopes for the nation. America would be able to survive the bad spells, partisanship and pride and abuse of power because its citizens would keep their commitment to freedom, equality and justice and pull the country back on track. The risky experiment is now 241 years old, only because each generation fought to keep faith with that foundation that Jefferson and Adams laid. Happy Fourth of July. For Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson. We'll see you next week.